Welcome to Republic's industry, industry series, How to Invest in Video Games. Thanks so much for joining. We've got a lot of people coming on right now. I'm watching the numbers tick up, so that's super awesome. We'll uh, give everyone a few moments to make their way into the, uh, the Zoom room, uh, but definitely excited to have everyone here, super happy about it. Uh, I'm Chuck Pettit, CEO of Republic. I'm joined today by uh, Justin Bailey, the founder of FIG. We're gonna be talking about the video game in, in industry and hope to share a lot of information with you. Um, we may as well get to it. I'm looking at the numbers and we're creeping up there to the total that uh, RSVP'd. So why don't we just go ahead and start. But before we do that, a little bit of a buzzkill. I gotta throw this out there. Of course, you gotta be compliant. Uh, this is just a presentation for educational and discussion purposes only. We're not here for investment advice to give you any either. Um, you know, do your own diligence and consult with your advisors. Investments on Republic are subject to a total loss of principle. Pretty scary stuff. So, but no, this is going to be fun. I can't wait to actually shed some more light on this, on this, you know, vertical, this opportunity that people have through Republic. Justin's an amazing resource. And I think you guys are going to see that during this uh, presentation today. As I said previously, I'm Chuck Pettit. I'm CEO of the Republic Crowdfunding Portal. I'm also president of FIG via recent acquisition. Republic acquired FIG, if you guys remember this past April. It's been an amazing situation for us. Um, great friendships have been built. Justin and I have been working on a lot of great things. We're bringing you, the investors, our clients, our customers, a lot of great opportunities in the, in the industry to invest in. Um, Hope to shed some more light on that so you guys get a bit of an understanding of how we do it, how we source those deals, how we do diligence on those deals, how we actually get them live in front of you. The compliance and regulatory steps that we go through to make that happen also, I think is super important for you to understand. And then where, that you, where you can take it from there. Just a quick overview on Republic. Um, I think you probably, a lot of you know by now, but Republic started about four and a half years ago. Uh, today, we have over 800,000 investors on our platform. We've helped over 200 companies raise capital. Uh, our investors, they can invest in these private companies regardless of their wealth, virtually anyone, anywhere. Uh, on average, each campaign ends up with 1,500 investors. That's a huge deal for our founders. Those supporters, those investors end up helping them grow their company in ways they never thought of before. So super powerful crowd effect is happening you know, daily at Republic. If you wanna learn more about Republic, definitely check us out at republic.co. Join our newsletter is a super simple way to learn more information. Check us out on Twitter, find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera. We even have a, a, a podcast named Pop that you can find on the Apple, Apple store. A little bit more about Republic. Um, before we dive into the video game discussion, just so you guys all understand, you know, Re Republic is a place for, for investors to come and have multiple opportunities across multiple industries and other things that are, are you know, it can help build their portfolio, it can help diversify their portfolio. We focus on tech and venture opportunities. We have a video game investment platform. We have a real estate investment platform. We have a main street investment platform. We've had a blockchain investment platform for a long time too. We want you investors to come find early, middle and late stage companies offering ec equity, debt, revenue share, um, anything in between so that you can properly invest and diversify your portfolio. So the gaming industry and where FIG fits in, I think that can best be told by the founder of FIG, Justin, um, I'm going to let him take it from here and we'll uh, go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Justin Bailey, I founded FIG about five years ago. Uh, prior to that, I was the COO of Double Fine. Uh, Double Fine has its uh, claim to fame as being the first multi million dollar Kickstarter. Uh, it was back in 2012, I believe. Um, basically, Double Fine Adventure started. Um, it, it raised a million in a day, uh, ended up with 3.3 million and about close to 100,000 backers. Uh, prior to that, Kickstarter's like their biggest successes 
um, would have about like 10,000 backers and a hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, it was pretty big. And then I actually joined shortly, shortly after that was done. Um, and, uh, Tim, Tim Schaefer, the head of the studio and the rest of them were like, Hey, we have, you know, we have this money now and we need to figure out what to do with it. So, uh, so that was my introduction to crowdfunding. Um, later on when I started FIG, uh, Tim joined me along with a bunch of other people, uh, Brian Fargo and Fergus Urquhart, who, uh, between all of them were responsible for the majority of multi-million dollar raises on, on Kickstarter um, at that time. So that was back in 2015. Um, prior to that, I was actually head of the Greenlight Committee at Namco Bandai Games. And uh, they had brought me on um, basically to do, um, to do acquisitions of game studios because in the previous life before games, uh, that's what I did. I actually did acquisitions for uh, movie studios. So um, they brought me on and then the, the very first day I came in, like this one publisher called Brash, um, which actually dealt with both movie properties and video game properties, uh, completely went belly up. And the, the video game, um, the, the acquisition we were going to do at the time um, fell apart. And so Namco was like, well, what do we do with this guy? And so they actually put me at the head of the Greenlight Committee um, their, their reasoning being that, you know, when you're funding a $20 million game, which basically is, you know, a studio, um, they're burned for four or five years for, for a fairly large team. Um, it's almost exactly like an acquisition. And actually I, I, I can see that comparison. So, um, jumping into the game industry real quick uh, on this slide, uh, you can see, you know, right now the projection is that the industry will be at 300 billion by 2025. Right now, I'm gonna say it's about half that. So, um, you know, a huge amount of growth in this industry is projected over the next, um, you know, few years. So, and then we're, we're gonna actually come back to this a little bit um, on, on some of the big accomplishments that have happened a little bit in the presentation. So let's go to the next slide. Um, cool. So uh, to start with an overview of the video game industry, um, it, it's actually, it's, it's helpful to know like how uh, how we make money, how do publishers and developers make money, and, and, and there's different business models. So a uh, premium business model is essentially you're paying one price for a product. So it's like what you are used to with console games. Uh, you can pay somewhere between, you know, 39 and now all the way up with the new consoles up to 69. Uh, it's just called 70 bucks because, you know, 69.99. But um, so that's what we're used to. A lot of us who started the industry um, a little while back, premium was actually the only business model. Uh, then there's actually free to play social. Uh, I'm throwing that together um, because you know a lot of these, all of these games will actually make money, and and you'll see these these go cross platform. But you'll see uh, they make money off microtransactions. Um, typically, the setup is you'll have you can grind, you can download the game for, for free, and you can grind, which means you're basically performing repetitive tasks over and over again, um, which is your time, or you can shortcut those tasks by paying a little money um, and then jump and get the reward early. Um, that's an example of one of the techniques. Uh, there are endless techniques and it's very sophisticated on how these companies make money. Um, and then of course there's advertising. Um, most of us are probably familiar with, like we're playing mobile games and you know some, an actual video will pop up and, uh, so games, uh, typically the games that are using a free-to-play mechanic are, are using both of these, these approaches. Uh, and then lastly, we have subscription. Uh, we are seeing that pick up. Um, you're seeing Sony and Microsoft with different offerings um, and they're really pushing those now as, as a way to generate revenue in the future. So, and reoccurring revenue streams. So uh, they see a lot of growth with that business model. So, um, and we'll probably talk about it a little bit later, but uh, those three studios that helped start FIG, which were uh, Double Fine, In Exile, um, and Obsidian, actually got acquired by Microsoft um, for the ability to, to add content to, to their subscription service. So, and then we have this is by no no means like an exhaustive list, but the horizontals that go across like all platforms, all business models. Um, you have influencers of which one of our team members actually qualifies as one. He actually, uh, Ash, um, who's on mute, uh, has like half a million followers um, on his YouTube channel. 
um, him and a group of other people. Um, and then, um, and that, that is actually causing, you're finding a lot with the industry um, that people are finding games through their favorite influencers now and not as much through like traditional uh, PR that you have seen in the past. So, and then of course, esports, which is the, the biggest buzzword right now um, with, uh, you know, live, live events, those, those huge pots and uh, very successful games that uh, are being played by, by professional clubs. Sorry not to derail you, Justin, but I think a good influencer example would be Marauder. It's a current campaign that's testing the waters over on fig.co. They had a few hundred, maybe 500 backers of their campaign at the time. And then there was a, a couple YouTube videos and they quickly shot up to around 1,750 backers. People who were interested in buying their game, people who actually did buy their game, um, really skyrocketed because of a couple simple YouTube videos. But it's also something that you deeply like analyze and watch too, I think, which is important for people to understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's, we'll get to that later too. There's a, yeah. there's like a due diligence checklist. Um, one of the things we look for in our games is social proof and it comes in many forms. And one of those forms is actually just that, having influencer influencers cover your games and how many have actually covered, covered it in the past. Um, so looking at high level, the major players, uh, once again, by no means an exhaustive list, but you know, you have your Sony's and Microsoft's uh, at the top because they, they create content. They also have very successful consoles. Um, as far as publisher goes, public publishers in the US, EA, Activision, Take Two, I can go down the list, everybody can read it. So um, it's there for you. Um, and then I'll get into private in just a second. But one thing to talk about the public companies is since we're on an investment webinar, should probably cover some multiples. Um, and so the, the revenue multiple, the lowest revenue multiple we have in the video game industry is not on the slide, is actually uh, Rovio, which is, uh, is trading at one times revenue right now. Um, I think that Zynga is somewhere, somewhere around there as well. Um, social games have not been as big in the industry as they were before. Um, we'll see that they're, they're kind of on the decline right now. And then one of the highest ones you actually see a uh, uh, revenue multiple is going to be CD Projekt. That's actually traded on a Polish exchange that is currently trading around 11x. Um, and then as far as PE ratios, um, you see the lowest actually is once again Rovio at around 15 times earnings. Highest we have right now is, is on the NASDAQ take two. Uh, it's trading at around 34 times earnings. So. And Justin, sorry, um, not to yeah. real again, but I'm getting, I get, I get pretty excited about this part. Prior to Republic, re, you know, Republic acquiring FIG, you had roughly, I say, 45 active offerings. How many times did Sony, Microsoft, Epic, et cetera, come in to acquire those games during your five years prior to Republic? I, I think I know the number, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I, mean, I could hit on that a little bit later, but um, so we're, we're getting ahead. So we'll, we'll one of the we'll one go of to the, that okay but right. we should really but, it's, but it's totally fine it's fun actually to do right now so um epic one of our games actually was used to launch epic um uh, their their game store which was phoenix point um apple arcade had one of our games its initial offering it's called kings and castles um we've had microsoft actually sign up multiple games uh, for their game pass um and then uh so we've seen we've seen a lot of success with the the um, the games we've helped to fund. And part of that is because the actual crowdfunding event does actually act as social proof. Um, and it almost is like, Absolutely. not almost like it is um, free marketing exposure for these games and really helps them actually stand out from the crowd. And, and some of those games you mentioned had 5,000 up to 30, I think 5,000 backers, investors in the game. And that like, it, that, that is social validation and proof that you know these companies, Microsoft, Sony, et cetera, are looking for when they acquire them after a round on FIG and Republic, that then accelerates the investors' returns. If you, if we can go in and properly negotiate, is that the case? It is. So our first game ever um, was called Outer Wilds. Um, it actually won Best Game of the Year at the BAFTAs this year, um, and. Uh, that game was actually picked up by Annapurna, and it was the first game that they signed. 
Um, when they did that, it was about six months after the crowdfunding campaign. And so I actually negotiated with all the investors and in about six months time, we had you know, 250, actually sorry, 270% return on the investment. Um, wow. It actually happens quite frequently, actually. Um, there's another game called Kings and Castles, which um, it basically signed an early distribution deal and its pre-orders were exclusive on another platform called GOG, G -O -G, uh, that's by the creators of uh, the Witcher C project. Um, and they paid, they paid enough money just to have that specific pre-order available to them um, to pay back the investors. And then that actual, that game actually made its money back uh, three times over um, for the investors in the first month of release. So games basically born on, on FIG have been acquired by the biggest names in the industry as well as gone on to win the equivalent of, you know, the Oscars for their actual product. Yeah. yeah. Um, Am I on the right page? Should I go to the next? I'm sorry about that. You should stay here because I really love this one. Um, I have to give a shout out to the visual capitalists. Uh, this is from, from them. Um, I just shared this on social media like a few days ago, but it's a really great uh, synopsis of the industry and like its evolution from the beginning. Um, I'll just point out a couple, a few things real, real quick right here, which is you know, the game industry is, is only about 50 years old. Uh, so it's very young. Um, obviously now you can look at the game industry as um, it's larger than the, the, the music and, and film combined. Um, I think, some of my some of the some of my friends in in the uh, film industry would always point out that we get the benefit of these consoles being added to that number, where they don't get the the benefit of, of the hardware being added to theirs, like DVD players and stuff. But at this point, I don't think anybody buys DVD players anymore, so I, I think it's a it's a fair fair analogy. But so if you're looking on the left side, you know it starts in 1972. Um, there's this stuff is really well documented. There's some great uh, ways to, to kind of um, see this whole journey of the game industry. Um, one book I would recommend, by the way, is Console Wars. Um, if you're more into watching things, there's a game called High Score on Netflix, and it just it does a great job of going through the whole industry. Uh, but basically, uh, the highlights um, back in 1984, Atari collapsed, the whole industry basically sucked into on itself. Uh, then Nintendo came back. Nintendo brought it back. Um, and you can kind of start seeing that with these consoles. Um, and you can see kind of arcade at that point was actually a substantial portion of the market. Um, it's really interesting graphic. You can look at all these franchises, how they come up. There, there is one really large snub in this whole thing, which I'll, I'll point out in a second. I'd, I'd love to, if this is more of a, a event where people can just like raise their hand and, and jump in. Actually, you can, if you can, if you can throw in what you think the big snub is, it's a whole, it's a whole, um, whole genre of games, which actually is not included in this. Uh, but, you know, if you go, if you go through, so nin Nintendo uh, fairly actually rescued um, the industry. Um, and then you go all the way forward to today, you can see, you know, this, this, uh, how big this, this industry has become. Um, one thing I would note though, is like one, of the, as an investor, you normally look at this and say, oh, wow, mobile is the, is where all the action's at. That's the, the fastest growing. And, um, one thing I encourage you is like, that is definitely a lens to look at things, but um, with FIG, especially one of the things that we look at is we're, we're platform agnostic. So we have games I've mentioned, we're on mobile, they're actually on VR, on PC, um, on console. And that is like one, one game is on multiple platforms. And so that's how we actually look at it is, is this game something compelling? Um, and then later on, we look at it as, you know, the genre and the platforms that it might be able to, to leverage. So, um, so that's one point. Um, I didn't see, I saw a couple of things on the chat uh, pop up, but um, social games was, was excluded. So, and, you know, I don't see it. And maybe I'm just not looking on here. I'm not seeing it on here. I think they see Farmville or Mafia Wars. Like that was actually a pretty darn big thing <laughs> in the game industry. When they came out, we thought that in you know, the game industry, like might actually become kind of uh, social games, and you know now it's since and since receded a bunch. Yeah, so. I, I think the biggest hole is that it's missing in television. I don't see the Intellivision Council on here. That's right. That's me. Yeah, it needs to be on it too. Um, yeah, in this page, you had mentioned that we would be revisiting it, so here it is. Yeah, we well, get some you get some good leading questions in there because you can see like this is the sum of success that we have with FIG, which we've now been able to, to work in here. One of the things we didn't mention, which I love to call out, 
Um, we could talk about Kimsey Castles and, and Outer Wilds. We also had another team called Look at All, a small team in Copenhagen, um, which actually beat out um, Call of Duty Mobile for best mobile game of the year, um, from multiple game outlets, um, one of which being IGN. That's about as big as it gets, right, that in the industry? Yeah, it's one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest uh, media outlets. Just while we're on what the golf, that company launched on FIG, and I, I believe investors were being paid back revenue share within what, 12 to 15 months? Yeah, so what the golf, um, they did a deal with Apple Arcade, and um, they then actually did a deal with Epic as well. So uh, that game, we, the, the investors, uh, you know, maxed out on their investment, um, yeah. which we'll talk about those terms in a little bit before the game even launched. And I think maybe it's important for us to, you know, at this point to talk to people about, let people know that you're investing in the success of the game via a revenue share agreement. Uh, this is something that uh, Republican Fig uh, will make an agreement with the developer of the video game, a revenue share agreement. Uh, we go through a process with the Securities and Exchange Commission to get it qualified. And then we can actually allow individuals, um, anyone, virtually anyone anywhere, regardless of their wealth, to invest in, that, in the success of that gain. The returns for investors that you don't own an equity stake in the game, you actually get a part of the revenue um, when, it be, when it actually occurs. Um, Justin, if I'm cutting ahead, let me know. Otherwise, I can keep going on that. Yeah, I think we can, we can, we can jump to the next slide. I think we'll, we'll, we can talk okay. through. Um, we do have a close slide which will show um, more of the revenue share mechanics. Perfect. Uh, so this, what, what, what this is, is basically our due diligence checklist. Um, we have a game which I think demonstrates it really well, which is called Phoenix Point. Uh, Phoenix Point was, um, we'll talk about like one of the first things we looked at with that game is its genre. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that um, there are certain genres that are just, for lack of a better word, their own right now. Like if you look at sports, you're gonna see EA um, is just synonymous with sports games. Um, first person shooters is gonna be very competitive. Any game that you're gonna fund needs to compete with Call of Duty directly. And you don't think if you bring something not just different but better, where people who are playing Call of Duty will put down that controller to play your game instead, um, it's probably best to, to not try. So um, you've got other ones, fighting games, Capcom, Namco, actually pretty much own those genres. Uh, and you have um, anyway, you can just you can kind of go through um, Nintendo. For the most part, owns um, platformers. We we funded some platformers, and you know they've had some games have had every single other portion of this list that we're going to go over. Um, but because they were going head to head with Mario, doesn't matter because you're competing for the player's time. So, but Phoenix Point, I bring them up because it's more of a genre mashup. So you have like a third person shooter and you have strategy game all in one. And so it brings elements um, of those two genres together and does it in a new way and has a unique hook in the way it does it, which is the next thing we look at that will, that will stand out. Something will stand out. So this is something that can then appeal to two very much established markets, um, bringing people in with a new experience. That's, that's different than what they, it's similar enough, but different from what they've already experienced. Um, then, you know, the other things we do is it, it's very much what you would see normally looking at a company, you know, what's their team, um, you know, what, have, what publishers have funded them in the past, um, have those publishers funded them multiple times, it's usually bad to see um, a developer who's going through multiple publishers and never going back to the same publisher. Uh, there are exceptions to this sometimes. Um, scope of project, obviously, you know, does it, does it seem like this, this probably might not come as a surprise to anybody, but um, a lot of game developers, um, you know, they, they estimate what it will take to make this game that they have in mind, and um, it'll be three times bigger by the time they're actually done with it. So, uh, which also is, you know, track record, just looking, can they, can they deliver on time um, and to a, to a certain quality bar? Have they achieved that in the past now? Now, I will say, um, you almost never get on time, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. If you can hit the quality bar and we're talking about you're 40% off the mark rather than 
hundred percent off the mark, you know, that's that's something to take into consideration. So, um, and then there's also the social proof. You know, if you run a successful crowdfunding campaign, you've had a bunch of views from uh, popular streamers. Um, if you've, you know, you've done, you have a video on YouTube that's got a bunch of, of, of views or a tweet that shows, you know, animated GIF that uh, people are really interested in the project that's been shared multiple times. That's really great social proof. Um, I will say though that, and this is where the, you know, the having experience in industry comes out is you will find people who you can just chuck this whole list um, because, you know, someone like, someone like a Tim Schaefer, um, who's developed one of the highest rated games of all time. If you just say, hey, maybe it doesn't matter that, um, you know, all these things on this list, we're just gonna give, that person just needs to like get all the money they need and all the time because they're gonna deliver just an amazing project. So, um, and those projects do come along every once in a while, so. Um, and we generally, when we have the chance to, 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 to work with uh, people that caliber, you know, we jump at that because um, you, will, you will see people that have had success in the past, they continue much like these rock star entrepreneurs who have, you know, created multiple successful companies. Uh, people who can create multiple successful franchises obviously exist in, in games as well. Yeah, no, we, we definitely jump at them. I mean, it reminds me of the trip that you and I took to Vegas about a week before the country and world shut down um, this past well, March, I guess. Um, hopefully a lot of really high quality experience developer games coming to, uh, to us soon, actually not even hopefully some already have. Mm, absolutely. Cool. And then a, a quick, quick, like case study on this, just showing what, what's happened. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, but Kings and Castles. So they came to us, they had about nine months until they were going to deliver their game. Um, this is, this is like the best scenario uh, for me, which is one of the reasons I bring it up is, is the ideal situation. They just needed 15,000 uh, bucks. All they needed to do was they want to polish the game, potentially go to some more platforms, um, look at doing some localization and some advertising. So uh, they tried to raise 15,000, they ended up raising over 100,000 of which 83,000 of that was actually investment. Um, and so they had like a small amount of interest at that point in time, but they did something very unique, which I liked which is after the campaign was done, they actually allowed people to download early builds uh, of that game. And they, they did it, they did that, um, you could only get it on fade. So it started driving more people to the page, um, but it started giving them the data they actually needed to help refine the game and, and build awareness. And so that just shows like, you know, they're, they're growing their potential um, influencers right there. So, uh, and they did actually have uh, streamers cover cover their game, um, came to FIG, bought, bought it. Uh, we didn't actually have to cut them in on, on any of the revenue. Um, they actually paid for the game and, and we covered it. And all that, all that actually led to huge groundswell um, that started getting them you know, these early deals, these early distribution deals with GOG. Um, but more importantly, just more people aware of this game. Um, so that when it came out, you know, it rose right above all the other games, all the noise potentially of, of, um, of releases. But if you don't know it, um, you know, about a hundred games release a week. So getting ahead, getting something in, and a lot of those are high quality games with great hooks. So, you know, anything you can do to actually get above that um, is, is crucial for the success. And what we saw with that is now over $10 million. So um, we had agreed with this, this deal to, to cap it. Um, one of the reasons we did that is because it was early on in, in FIG's life cycle. Uh, since then, we've actually decided to um, not cap our deals, but have them rather time boxed. So with our new deal structure, so, so these investors made you know, 3X of money back and they made like right when the game launched. Um, but if we had our, our new deal terms, which time box it rather than, than cap the revenue, um, some of these early investors actually have been multimillionaires uh, based on based on performance game. New deal terms, very important. Um, I'll call out too, just so people understand, when you go to a, a Republic Fig campaign, you have the opportunity to invest or to pre-order the game. Um, when he says pledges of $25,000 and investment of $83,000, that's the difference. The real cool thing also with the new um, agreement that we've come up with for, for current and future deals is that 
when visitors buy the game, they pre-order it, those, when those revenues actually become, you know, come to fruition, that actually then gets paid back to, potentially paid back to the investors per the, per the revenue share agreement. So the more people that buy the game, the more likely and the more money investors will get paid back once the you know, game gets out there, which is a, a pretty powerful I don't know, community event. Yeah. Yeah, one thing to point out about this is that then there's, there's about seven investors that have the majority of that money into that project. So we do get that a lot where we'll have um, you know, people that are really passionate about it will come in. Um, and I actually queried those investors to see, you know, what they thought and the majority of them was, they just liked what the game was about and they wanted to help make it possible. So cool. Let's uh, go forward. Oops. Jumped one ahead. Now we wanted to talk about the structure, what the investment structure is. Um, Justin, you want to take that one down too? And then I'll, I'll do the next. I know sure. I brought it up a few different times, but like we can probably, yeah, go back and forth on it. Yeah, no worries. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll we get to some questions. Actually, uh, we have a we have a demo of a, of a live deal right now. Yeah, we'll do the live deal real quick, and then hopefully have about ten minutes left for questions. There were well over a hundred that were sent to us before um, mm -hmm. today's webinar, and I bet it just going by the the Q and A chat field, it looks like there's probably 30, 40 more. So we, we have awesome. a lot of questions. We'll try to get that very soon. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll drain. Um, I won't drain this slide. I'll go through it pretty quickly, but. Uh, basically on the left, we just have, you know, how money actually gets to developers. So we do revenue share investments, as Chuck mentioned. So you are not, uh, you're not investing in the studio. You're investing in the future net revenues of, of the project. Um, and so that money comes to FIG, then the money from FIG goes through a licensing agreement to the developer. Uh, very standard licensing, uh, which would happen with normal publishers when you're dealing with, uh, with game developers. So, and then... As future sales happen, which is on the right, uh, the developer, we, we have our portion of the pie, uh, our revenue share, which gets sent to us, and then we send it out to investors uh, via dividends. Right, and so our negotiations with the developer um, on the license agreement is important. We're trying to get the most revenue share possible for you, the, the investor, while also being mindful of the developer. They have business expenses and marketing costs that if we take too much revenue can actually stall out their business. Um, so it's a very detailed oriented review and discussion. I wouldn't say it's so much a negotiation. That sounds you know contentious. It's, it's a, a definitely a working relationship with the developer. Um, so everyone's getting, you know, their equal share. And at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, you know, very valuable to investors and the developers and they can't be without each other which is awesome they're all aligned uh, to the success of the game so real quick you know and this will be the last stop before we go to q a i just wanted to show one deal page that we have currently um, live on republic there was a new deal launched on fig today it's just testing the waters you can leave an investment indication but you can't actually we can't actually accept the investment until we go through the sec qualification process uh, there is a second deal and a third i'm sorry a second and third deal that are also coming up to republic probably in the next uh, 15 to 45 days maybe one by the end of the year and then um, possibly two more during january so more opportunities are coming but this is a current live one on republic so let's take a quick look um, wait one sec. So I, I jokingly mentioned earlier in, in the in the chart that Justin was going over the history of the video game industry that it was missing in television and television was a very popular uh, in, uh, video game console back in the 80s. It competed uh, with Atari. It was actually the biggest competitor in, in television. Atari is the biggest competitor. Um, and they were since resurrected, not from the dead. It was always something that people always continued playing with or owned or talked about. There's a lot of nostalgia in the industry about it. And uh, a, a gentleman named Tommy Tallarico uh, bought the company. He brought back the, the video game console, which he's launching next year. He also owns the video game library that Intellivision had. He added a few other pretty valuable uh, video games from the Atari library even. And... Justin and I went and met him in Las Vegas uh, with actually a lot of other developers that day and uh, that night. And he liked the Republic Fig story and decided to move forward with us. And then we negotiated a revenue share agreement with 
in television, went through an SEC qualification process, and then launched a deal officially to actually accept investment. So our first one together, uh, you can see it's raised about 6.7 million. But this is where you'd come to learn more about Intellivision or Marauder, who I mentioned before, um, and the others that will be coming live in, in late 2020, early 2021 as well, plus more beyond that. Uh, you can find them on republic.co slash fig, or in this case, republic.co slash intellivision dash amico to learn more. But we just want to quickly go over a deal page. I think it's super important for people to kind of see um, where everything lies so they can do their own diligence and they can ask their own questions and they can you know do their own research. Um, terms are always going to be you know listed prominently at the very top of the deal page. And then we really want you to kind of also get into the story. You want to understand where this company is coming from and who they are, why they're doing this. Uh, for in television Amico, it's really about like you know creating an alternative to the Playstations and Xboxes of the world who kind of dominate that um, more, I guess, I don't, you know, violent video game market. They want to make this more family friendly. I think, you know, safe is one of their acronyms that they use. <laughs> there it is, simple, affordable family entertainment. Um, a key place that I like to go to when I'm actually on a deal page considering making investment myself is the team. I already mentioned Tommy. Uh, he's been in the industry for a long time. Um, he's actually in the Guinness Book World Record for making the most development or being part of the most games ever developed. Not even on the top line, you got this guy, Jay Allard. He was actually uh, the, you know, he was the inventor of um, Xbox Live. He worked at Microsoft for about 20 years, uh, 25 years. I think he also did Xbox 360 as well. Um, he's known as the father of the internet per um, uh, the founder of Microsoft. Can't think of his name right now for some reason, but I'm just getting at, like, look at their team, find out who they are, learn about what they've been up to. Um, are they actually experienced? I got another guy here. He's a former president of Nintendo in the United States. So um, pretty interesting team. But perhaps maybe the most powerful place to go is to ask questions. You can ask questions to founders any day. Some of these you see that I'm answering. Uh, they had something to do with you know compliance or logistics. You know, can I invest if I'm from Canada? So I'm answering those. But Tommy does jump in. Uh, his CFO Nick Richards jumps in. Uh, they are ready and willing and wanting to talk to potential investors as well as potential customers. So really great way to get more information, really great way to act, you know, interact and engage with the founding team right here on the deal page. Um, learn everything you need to learn to make an informed decision. So with that, I think maybe we should go to questions. We've only got maybe seven, eight minutes left. Um, Justin, I can't open them up, but you have them out in front of you, the ones that had came before the actual webinar started. Maybe I can pull up the Q&A that's in the chat field too, but if you want to shout a few out, we can start going through those. Yeah, I mean, the first two, hold on, my hearing an echo. All right. uh, the first two, one is about how an example of uh, YouTubers leverage their audience um, to promote a new game. So we actually talked about that a little bit um, with Marauder. Um, and then we also talked about, can you invest in future game consoles? So I think we're doing good with uh, having answered the first two on there. Um, one of the ones which was really interesting is someone is, uh, we had a, a few questions in this vein, which is, um, why would I invest in a video game project instead of an index fund? And then can, how can you invest in multiple games? Um, this is actually the, the, the single most, um, common question we get is, can we invest in multiple games? And so we're actually going to uh, talk more about that in the future. Please sign up for our, our newsletter. Um, but we've been doing a lot of research into that. And so um, as you guys have seen, most of what we covered is you invest in a single game and it has revenue. Um, the results for FIG for the last three years have been positive. If you, uh, if you assume that you invested $1,000 in each project um, every year, you would have gotten uh, positive returns. So. Um, and now adding in new deal terms where we don't have revenue caps on them, uh, it looks even better. So um, I think that with the three year returns are something like 17%, 45%, and 12% over seven, I'm sorry, yeah, 17, 18, and 19, 2017, 18, and 19. Yeah. We are, yeah. You know, we're actually taking Justin's experience and his understanding of the market and that like model of identifying potential opportunities and then 
you know, not to let the cat out of the bag, but we've been working in the background on, on actually developing what we'll call a fig, you know, fig portfolio um, that will be available to anyone to invest in, not just accredited investors. We hope to do that sometime in Q1 of 2021, but there'll be more to come out, you know, out on that. We're going through a lot of paperwork and a lot of uh, regulatory matters for it, but it is one of our goals in 2021 is to offer up a portfolio that then we would take to invest in each of these games and you see it as a way to bring in some really, really high quality games who are looking for money quickly. They all love the concept of, you know, investment crowdfunding, but a lot of them don't have time for it because they already have contracts and they need to make things quickly. So if we can cut them a check for, you know, whatever it is, a few hundred thousand dollars, perhaps more, they can go right into development, which then means that they will get out to the market sooner and be able to generate revenues, which we'll have a revenue share agreement on and then be able to take that cut and pay back investors. Yeah, yeah. We, we saw something, it was, it was pretty ridiculous. We went back over um, our pitch list to see games that have been pitched to us and uh, about 70% of the new indie hits were either known to us or pitched to us directly. Uh, and we closed on, closed on kind of smaller portion of those. And the number one reason that we lost um, games was because we required the crowdfunding component of it. And so those games weren't, they, the type of game they were or the team just didn't want to deal with crowdfunding, but they had plenty of other social proofs which would have worked in its place. And so, um, so you know, we the idea of these portfolio shares has come from feedback from you know our our investors up to, up to now, um, but also it works better for the developers. So it seems to just make sense. Yeah, it definitely it could be. You know, I, I think it will be awesome. I can't actually wait to get that out there. We'll start to promote it in advance so people have you know knowledge of it and when it's coming and how to get involved. This actually you know is relatable to a question that Sandra, by the way, who is our, our great colleague who sets up these webinar events, uh, goes through hell and back to make them happen. <laughs> it's not easy to do. So just you know a shout out to her. She's texting me texting me some questions because I don't want to disrupt the actual video recording. Uh, one of them is, what is it, you know, the minimum minimum investment? Uh, you know, we're going somewhere between two hundred and fifty dollars to a thousand dollar minimum investment. Uh, that's that's higher than what you typically see on you know other investment crowdfunding platforms. You know, even Republic included. Uh, part of the reason is is that in a revenue share agreement, we we it's difficult to have someone make a twenty five dollar investment and then they get their pro rata you know revenue share portion of say it would be a you know whatever three four five bucks the processing fees and it's are they going to get an ACH or a wire or a, you know are we going to send it via check in the mail uh, so with those things in consideration we like to have a little bit higher uh, minimum investment amount just so it makes sense sense economically. Uh, some of those costs are incurred by us. Some of those costs are incurred by you. Some of them are actually very cheap, but it still does make more sense if there's a higher minimum investment made initially before those revenue shares are paid out. Yeah. Um, I saw I saw a couple um, people are saying, like, what is unique hook? And then like somebody else, like, you know. Um, so what, one, of the, one of the things we, um, or that I heard, if you guys know Sid Meier, he developed uh, the Civilization series. He actually has kind of a formula what he does with his game, and he basically does um, the next installment always has a third stays the same, um, a third is modified, and a third is new. Um, and so one of the things we look at, like as a unique hook, is uh, we don't want something that's so completely different um, from everything else that exists. That's hard to get the, the gamer's head around it. It's a, it, that's a really hard, um, that's a hard task. For, for marketing it and getting people to, to really understand it. So a unique hook is generally something that um, a, a fan base can relate to, um, but has brought something something else to the equation. So Kings of Castles is a good, is a good example. Like when you look at Kings of Castles, the art style looks like Minecraft. Um, you look at, you know, there's a lot of people said it looks like Rampart, which is like this old nostalgic game. Um, and some people didn't even realize that they like it looked like a game they knew, but um, they didn't know what, what the game was. They just knew it looked familiar, um, but it brought it together in a, in, a, in a city building game. And so that kind of encompasses those that multifaceted uh, appeal is what you consider a new hook. So it, as far as that game goes, let me get in one more question, and then we got to say our goodbyes. But um, you know, the question is when do, when will Fig integrate with Republic? We're, in, we're working on that. It will happen soon. Uh, right now, we're using FIG for basically testing the waters, pre-sale campaigns, and then we're using Republic for the SEC qualified investment campaigns. 
Soon enough, I hope in Q1, you'll start to see more and more things integrated. If you have an account on FIG, we're looking at ways and already, have already mapped out ways that you automatically have an account on Republic. We'll communicate with you about that once it actually is possible to, uh, to do that. But we're working really hard behind the scenes to make this all come together. We're definitely out of time. Uh, 345 on the dot right now, Eastern time. I had a great time. Uh, Justin, thank you for all the insight and information. You were awesome. Um, please do check out a couple campaigns, whether it's on FIG or Republic, ask the founders questions, reach out to us, investors at republic.co. Um, you know, do what you need to get involved because this is a pretty sweet opportunity and we specifically went out and got it to bring it to you guys. So awesome. thank you all. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks.